Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the THO Movie Reviews Podcast, the show where we bring you passionate, honest, and insightful film criticism. I'm your host, Bennett Campbell Ferguson, and I'm joined today by two of my wonderful colleagues, starting with Mo Shanette. Mo, how are you? I'm here. And you have, uh, uh, for the first time in, since, in a while since we've done one of these, you have a, uh, a hat. I, I always wear a hat. Well, yes, no, 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 but, but you slightly, never. I have a slightly fancier hat. You do. You have a you have a new hat. You have a you, you have, have a, a, a mariner's a, a mariner's pork pie hat. Yeah, I guess is the best been, way to describe it. That's been living in my closet because it only comes out in summer. But I like yeah, it. I yeah, like yeah. it. Also, I'm wearing here, a hat. That's something. Also, here we have Maxwell Myers. He has no hat. No but hat. He is here. No hat. No sleeves. My car just broke down outside of Ben's <laughs> house. I'm hoping to stay for dinner. Did your car really break down? No, it didn't. I was I was alluding to a movie I recently saw called Beatrice at Dinner. I'm hoping we can also get fed just as well. There better be brisket. There better be sorbet. I can't remember anything else they ate, but it all looked delicious. Oh, they had some kind of fish, fish or beef. It was. It looked delightful. So basically what you're trying to say is you're Salma Hayek. I, if I could be Salma Hayek, <laughs> even for five minutes, my life, I could die a happy man. What? Who wouldn't? I, so, she seems so happy, and uh, I, she, she's friends with Alec Baldwin. I mean, that could go either way. <laughs> I think you just pit, pitched a great summer movie right there. But <laughs> being maybe Salma that's Hayek, just the, the yeah. long-awaited sequel to being John <laughs> Right, right, right. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we're gonna get I mean, Spike like, Jones to come direct I mean, this and Charlie okay, Kaufman. Okay, in right? all honesty, if that movie were made, it would literally just be a bunch of people lining up to be Selma Hayek for five minutes and just grope themselves. I mean, that's just yeah. rough. I mean, that's the state of the world. Oh. Yeah. Well, I know what I'm doing with the rest of my time now. <laughs> well, we... that was the creepiest segue ever. <laughs> uh, ma- making that movie. Oh, okay, uh, that's all right. <laughs> we'll fix that in editing. Okay. <laughs> well, we are here today to uh, do a number of things. Uh, uh, most uh, largely of all, if that's even a word, we are going to review Edgar Wright's new film, Baby Driver. But we're also going to save some time to talk about some other movies we've yes. seen, and then they get to some assorted, you know. T-H-O business. If largely is not a word, our president has given us Bigly. <laughs> you know, I learned that, I was really disappointed to learn that Bigly is an actual word. What? Yeah. No. It, was, it, was, it, was, it was, I was so disappointed because it was fun to think that he just invented that. You know, so. Oh, damn. But it, it, do, it doesn't sound real. It doesn't <laughs> sound real. I guess he just slapped his name on something that suddenly lost a lot of value, which is... Not unusual. Bigly <laughs> trademark. <laughs> Better luck next time with that Kofevi thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we could do a whole podcast about that. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> uh, but getting on to uh, Baby Driver, um, uh, uh, the first thing I wanted to ask you guys is, I mean, this, uh, this movie has had quite an impact. It's uh, got a Rotten Tomatoes score in the upper 90s. Uh, last I checked, I think it was around 98. Uh, in a matter of days, it became the highest grossing film uh, domestically of Edgar Wright's career. So, a lot of hype, a uh, lot to live up to. So, I just want to ask you guys, starting with you, Max, what did you think of the movie, and did it live up to the hype for you? Um, I tried to go in as blind as possible with this one. Uh, I saw the trailer once. I knew it was Edgar Wright, and uh, I was. it was weird. I watched the trailer, and I remember going... This movie looks bananas. I can't wait to see it. But then I didn't watch anything else, so I almost forgot like who was going to be in it at times. Uh, I would say I did like it. It's a good movie. But uh, I was noting my friend, he goes, how could you say this is not one of the best movies you've seen this year? And I was like, and as I've noted with both of you, we've kind of been spoiled this year. I've seen a lot of we have really yeah. good movies. And uh, so I think maybe if we had had a more meh, mediocre year, Baby Driver might have knocked my socks off. More so. If this uh, came out in 2016, it would have been oh, yeah, insane. I, I exactly. <laughs> I'm like, this movie is amazing. And I'm not saying the movie isn't amazing, but it's had some really stiff competition. And that's saying something because well, usually these months are for the garbage movies. Sure. And sure. So, uh, but, I really, but I enjoyed it. So, it, it's, so, so, so you, I mean, you're you know, saying it's not, you know, the greatest thing ever but but you but you're saying that's that's more due to you know comparison with kind of the wealth of riches we have then 
to anything that's wrong with the movie itself. Yeah, I think maybe if I had heard nothing, if I had heard no one say anything good or bad, I might have been a little more like, <gasps> but it's like, all right, I know this movie's going to be good, and it was. I would say go in it with it with no expectations. Mo, what about you? Um, so I've said uh, multiple times, Edgar Wright is my favorite director. Um, he's it's, an incredible talent. He's so much talent. It's it's that he can use. He can show off stylistically, but it doesn't feel like smug or showboating. Or showboating. It's just like no, this is what I constructed this story to be a vehicle for this uh, uh, for these these camera movements and this editing and this soundtrack and all this stuff. Um, he he indulges in genre film, but he does so in a way that there's something else to be said, that it's, there's, there's some, there's some brains behind it. Um, and he's just really, he's funny and he knows how to put together a good movie. Um, so I went into this with some high expectations, but kind of ch trying to check them because that only lets you down. It usually, it sets myself up for disappointment. Um, this met my expectations. It's a s phenomenal movie. Honestly, it's so so stylish, so much fun, so cool. Um, it feels it also. I also said this on Facebook. It feels like his weakest film because the narrative is very much. It's just straightforward. It's just a crime thriller. There's a lot of stylized stylization. Uh, it, there's a lot of stylization to it. There's a lot of flourish. There's a lot of energy, but story wise, it's very straightforward. Um, and it, it kind of feels like, not necessarily a step back, but a step sideways. Like, it's, this is the kind of movie you would expect someone to be someone's first movie. Like, this is just them showing up, these are my talents, this is what I can do. Um, and, I, I, I know I'm kind of damning with faint praise, but it's, it really is a fantastic movie. Yeah. Uh, is I was kind of high, like faint praises, and I was like, I feel like I'm saying the movie's good, but I don't sound excited at all. And it's, well, well, knowing that knowing that he had, like this is an idea he's been sitting on for like 22 years makes mm -hmm. a lot of sense. Sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I, going off of you know what you're saying, I I do have to agree. I think this is uh, the the weakest film of his career, and uh, there's a and the reason I I think that you know really has you know to do with how he plays with the different genre tropes in this film like uh, and I, I can't believe it I, I'm uh, I'm reluctant to you know bring this person up yet again within the span of a single podcast but I am going to talk about Donald Trump <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, for um, uh, uh, no particular reason at all uh, recently I uh, like much of America suddenly became curious about Joe Scarborough and Mika Brzez Brzezinski you know no, for no reason at all. No, just totally just random. Out of the blue. Well, and I, I listened... As one does. As one does. And I listened uh, to an interview where uh, uh, Joe Scarborough was talking about Trump. And he said that uh, the Donald Trump uh, now is nothing like, you know, uh, the Donald Trump of a couple years ago. And he said, you know, the Donald Trump of back then was in on the joke that is Trump. You know, that he, you know, could say something like, you know, like, Here's a glass of Trump water, you know, kind of like wink, like you know, like, I, I know this whole thing is ridiculous, and you know, uh, and you know what he was saying is that now Trump is not in on the joke, and I am by no means going to compare Edgar Wright to Donald so Trump because Edgar say. Wright actually seems like a nice guy. He's a very funny guy, <laughs> and is actually actually tries to bring you know beauty and wonderment and pleasure to the world, but. Uh, I, I do get that sense watching Baby Driver that, you know, Edgar Wright was the one who made jokes, and now it feels like he's kind of not in on the joke, because I saw him kind of play into really cliched tropes in this movie that uh, I think he would have mocked before, with, you know, viciously and hilariously, but um, uh, he, he played them seriously in this movie, and I was, I was kind of alarmed, like, because, like, you know, seeing, you know, in the trailer, like, you know, you know, when, you know, Lily James saying, like, I want to get out of here, baby. I thought, you know, <laughs> I'm sure Edgar Wright is joking that he's making fun of, you know, the idea of, like, you know, kind of the the motivation to save the perfect girlfriend. And I was, I was really disappointed. He's not making fun of it. 
he's he's serious, and this is a this you know movie is the first Edgar Wright movie that I think is a, is not a comedy. I think it's a drama with comedy, and there's nothing yeah. inherently wrong with that. But to me, I just don't think he's a as as good a dramatist as he uh, he is a comedian. comedian. But uh, but kind of you know segueing in from that you know I wanna I, I do want to talk about the the Lily James character and also the foster father character because I mean you know comedy drama you know at its heart this is you know a pretty pure action movie yeah. and in any action movie you know uh, while the action is important and this this film has some great action you know whatever my misgivings about givings about it I really. Enjoyed the car chase and this and I especially enjoyed they were that so foot good. chase. They were yeah, so well thought out, brilliantly constructed. But I mean, like any action movie, you know, you know, this spins around the the motivations and the motivations of the characters. So I'm just curious, what did you guys make of uh, his, uh, you know, baby's relationship with the Lily James character and is also also with the the foster father character because those are the two, you know. That are really motivating him. Uh, what did you think, Mo? Um, as far as Deborah goes, uh, I think this is this is that's definitely for me a criticism of the movie because she comes off as a very flat character through it. She's very much she has limited agency up until the very end. She's mostly just, uh, in so many words, along for the ride. Um, sure. It's uh, uh, it, it feels very much like a fantasy. You know you. Uh, I cannot speak for I, I I work in the service industry, but I can't speak for the experiences of any waitresses. I think that if I came across a like super quiet white dude wearing sunglasses indoors <laughs> recording everything I say, I might be a little creeped out instead of charmed. See, th this is this is yeah. what I got hung up with on. I I, would, I was like, she's not gonna throw him out. I mean, this is a creepy dude, you know. Yeah. I, well, see, what I thought was weird is it seemed like he was kind of pining after the other girl up until Lily James walked in. But I think they were the or, same person. It's just kind of a time skip. Sort okay, of okay, and let's let's were let's they? let's was... let's plug into the um, the motherly elephant in the room. He was <laughs> after a waitress who's a waitress at the um, uh, the same place where his mother who died worked. Who uh, sings much like his mother does. Yeah, so. I, I find it really strange that there's these, this, you know, really, uh, like, strong, it's, edible, you know, it's, it's uh, undercurrent current, and, like, yeah. like they didn't, Edgar Wright didn't even make a joke out of it, because that, to me, is funny. Like, the old Edgar Wright would have had so much fun with that's, that thing. I, I think that's just... <laughs> but that's the so thing about edible aspect. drama. It's, it's subconscious, so, yeah. you know, maybe, maybe he didn't... I'm, I'm, he was I'm not saying that, but I'm just saying. <laughs> I... Uh, I would like to note, I really like the choreography in it. Uh, I know that that sounds really strange Which to say. Which choreography in particular? Uh, just the way they move. Uh, I recently yeah, yeah. Uh, saw a video with Mandy Moore. She was talking about uh, choreography in movies. And it's like, it's not just a spontaneous dance movie. They're like, you need a long, you need a big dance number where Emma Stone's and Ryan Gosling ballroom dance in the sky. We do that. You need someone to declare their love for someone oh, you're in the form of you're, flash mobs. You're talking about that Mandy Moore. That Mandy Moore. <laughs> for a second, I oh, was thinking... Oh, sorry. Mandy Moore, <laughs> the choreographer... I was thinking 47 meters down. No. But that's another story. Sorry, Mandy continue. Moore, the, the choreographer, she did right. choreography for La La Land. Uh, she, and she was also talking, but aside from that, she goes, but also, when someone moves across a room, if they need to, like, convey a certain emotion, she goes, they'll call in choreographers to do that. When he's wandering down the streets and avoiding people and running into people and, like, that point, like, that almost seems like a dance while he's, like, you know, listening to his music, getting coffee. Yeah. That's all choreographed. That's a choreographer did that. And, I mean, the way he moves, like, through his apartment, that part where he walks around to go make a sandwich and swings on the bar, that was a choreographer. So I did notice, I was like, wow, there's a lot of, and you've, you've actually got a good credit right at the beginning, and so... I did have a little like I was like choreographer. Then I noticed all the movement. I was like, oh yeah, no, they did a really great job. Sure, yeah, no, I mean, uh, I, by by the end of the movie, even though I had kind of fallen out of love with with it, you know, for the the first few scenes and you know watching, you know, when he moves through the street and you know like like dodges under that that, that you yeah know, wooden beam those guys are carrying. You know, while I'm walking, was, I I was thinking, you know, like wow, this is one of the coolest things I've seen all year. Yeah, you know, I mean that's. Uh, that's absolutely brilliant stuff. Yeah, and so that's so yeah. The, uh, getting back to, to what we were saying, Lily. 
Lily is a flat character. She, yeah, she's. I, I wasn't I think super. James did a good job. I think she was. Uh, she's a good actress, and she sold it. It was believable, and I actually kind of bought into the relationship. Like it's a fantasy, but there's enough stylization going on that's like, yeah, you can you can kind of set aside logic for a bit and just ride the emotion of it. And for me, it worked. I think I think like the way to I way to like you know really like you know make that part like really fly would have been to like like play it satirically you mm -hmm. know and like kind of kind of make fun of you know the you know the criminal who you know you know picks up the the beautiful girl like uh, I'm probably going to talk about you know Bonnie and Clyde a lot during this because Bonnie and Clyde you know is uh it's a reference point in this movie for a, a big reason. You know, I mean, uh, you know, that movie starts with, you know, Warren Beatty, you know, saying to Beatty, you know, hey, come rob banks with me, you know. Like, <laughs> and that, that's, a, that's a very serious thing, and I, I love Bonnie and Clyde, but, you know, I think, you know, that kind of thing is, is ripe for mockery, and, you know, it's just... It's You're saying just, that there, there were so many opportunities to lampoon anything, and he didn't jump on it. Yes. Yeah, there there were there were a lot of you know opportunities to lampoon, and lampooning is what he does best. I mean, look at look at Scott Pilgrim. Look what he did. He destroyed the nerd you know hero genre. He ripped to shred you know movies like uh, you know Napoleon Dynamite and uh, Spider Man, which I also love, but I enjoyed seeing him you know make but a mockery it's, of it it's too. The, po the point of Scott Pilgrim is that Scott Pilgrim is a child. Yes. Like, he's 23 years old, but he acts, he has the emotional maturity of a high schooler. And that's the point of the movie, is that... But so does Baby. It just felt like Edgar Wright wouldn't get that, acknowledge You do get, get some of that with Baby, too. But it's, it, he's... It, Baby's kind of a puzzle, honestly. Like, it's, it's... We don't know exactly what his deal is, and no one else does. And it's, and that's part of the movie, is figuring him out. So, like, is he... Kind of have, does he have this kind of arrested development kind of thing where he's he's still very much childlike in the way he views things and he, that's definitely there but also he's aware of just how bloody a business he he's in clearly um, yes he has definitely fallen in with the wrong people <laughs> <laughs> the wrong being uh, the the guy from a bug's life <laughs> what never trust Kevin Spacey is that what you're saying <laughs> but that it's but and there's just the the way he, the way he acts around the around the criminals versus the way he acts around Joseph, his foster father, just being this at ease, uh, just dancing around while making a sandwich, uh, kind of thing. Versus when he's with the criminals, where he always has a backup pair of sunglasses. He's always listening to his music. He's always as shut off from them as he can be. Sure, sure. I and I love Joe. <laughs> his foster father. I really like just watching the the interplay between the two of them. It was awesome. It's a great performance, I think. I I was a little I, I was a little frustrated by the the fact that I felt like like Joseph was was a tool to humanize baby to like and and then it's like, you know, well, it like I mean, for gosh sakes, he, he drops the guy off at a nursing home at the end where the criminals could easily find him and kill him. You know, That's how, what I was, how, I was how like, the son is he? You know, like, like, and, I, with, and I with, felt like they were trying with, to like kind of you know make me make us weep in a way that I, I didn't buy. But sorry, go ahead, Mo. With a lot of money, that is probably going to be reclaimed by the cops because yeah, it's yes. stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's just and it's felt like you know that like that scene like where he's saying goodbye to Joseph. Like, it would have been so much funnier if, you know, Joseph is, you know, signing, like, you know, fuck you, man. You know, you're shoving me in a nursing home and it's supposed to having this, you know, heartfelt, sensitive thing where they're parting, you know. It's like, no, no, you know, no. I, I feel like, it's it's weird. It's like, it's like, like the more real of a situation we, like, he works with, the more scrutiny we put under it. I mean... You're right. Like that, that whole like, sure, he's leaving him off at a nursing home. Not great. He's giving him a lot of cash. It's probably gonna be reclaimed. <laughs> I feel like when you go, you know, London pub zombie apocalypse, you question a lot less things about it. You're like, they're like, well, we're gonna go to the well, pub. Yeah, yeah the, that's true. It's that's farther removed from reality, so it's kind of just we trust him because he's making it up. I, well, well the, yeah. The, do you think yeah. his his tale is a little exaggerated? Which I will say is part of Edgar Wright's great. Like. 
his moves is he's a little bit exaggerated and it's yeah. fun to watch. Absolutely. Especially Absolutely. like something like Space to where it's uh them to Simon Pegg and his roommate living in Jessica London. Jessica Stevenson. Yeah. So good. I didn't I was like I'd say her name but no one knows who she is even though they should. But <laughs> I was like Stevenson. But she he, co-wrote the show. She deserves more respect. She deserves I love her. I like her more than I like Simon Pegg's character if that <laughs> makes any difference. But I'm just saying but even then, that's a fairly normal situation, but they act very ridiculous, and I don't know why I'm like, but this one, it's like, I feel like, it was fairly ridiculous, but we are kind of a little more, you know, I think we're putting a little more scrutiny in it than we usually do. Well, I, actually, I, I would, uh, I, I, I sort of uh, see what you're saying, because a more realistic, you know, situation in, uh, it invites more scrutiny, you know, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, you know, Wendy and Lucy, you know, invites a different, you know, uh, scrutiny than The Dark Knight, because The Dark Knight is heightened reality, Wendy and Lucy is, you know, almost a docudrama, but uh, here's the thing, I would argue that um, as ridiculous as Shaun of the Dead is, the, the characters, you know, the way they behave in that situation is actually more believable than the way the characters behave in Baby Driver, and I say that because you think about that incredible joke, one of the best jokes in any of, you know, Edgar Wright's films, you know, where they say, you know, we'll go to the Winchester till all this blows over. <laughs> you know I mean? It's like, even though it makes no sense to go to the, you know, to go to the pub, you know, during the zombie apocalypse, they just want to drink. It's like, yeah, these There's guys are... safety to it. There yeah, this, this guy, well, this like guy, it's... these guys are so irresponsible. I believe that they would risk their necks just to get to the pub, you know? But also... Whereas I don't believe that Joseph, you know, would you know, you know, not be mad at, you know, Baby for just dumping him off, you know? Like, it's all about, like, you know, kind of believability within the context. And so it's like, you know, is there more scrutiny? Well, yes, but then again, Edgar Wright kind of brought that on himself. So, well, that's my question, is if we're going to put that kind of scrutiny under him, do you think he just we're going to have to let him feel out these more the reality-based movies, or should he... Or, or do we really have any right to go, maybe you should just stick with your fun, over-the-top movies? Like, well, here's the thing. I mean, it was only a matter of time before uh, I think he made uh, a, a serious movie. Because, you know, I, I think, you know, in a good in a good way, Shaun of the Dead and Hot Fuzz were pure silliness. Scott Pilgrim was, you know, you know, getting at some, you know, really, you know, serious undercurrents. Because if you look at who Scott Pilgrim is beneath the comedy, he's a pretty despicable person. Yes. Then you get to the world's end, and, you know, you, you get... Um, uh, you know, Nick Frost saying in his voice over the end, you know, I'm you know, not actually sure I ever enjoyed any processed foods. And it's like, whoa, you know, there's, <laughs> there's, there's, there's a message here. And it was, I liked that, you know. So I think, you know, that's been coming on. I mean, as, you know, do we have a right to say you should stick with this? You should, you know, stick with that, you know. I, I mean, you know, look, I'll say this for this movie, you know. This is a, this is a very pure eccentric vision and that's yes. a lot more than most filmmakers you know nowadays can claim because you know you know a lot of filmmakers these days aren't even filmmakers they're studio stooges you know and uh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and so i mean you know you know like of course you know i have my idea of the perfect Edgar Wright film and i you know, want to see that but i mean you know he's a great auteur he wants to experiment oh, yeah. he wants to play around you know let him do he it, you know. To make an idea that's been sitting in his head for twenty two years. Yeah, and you know this is the thing. Like, I'll let him do whatever he wants. Uh, uh, this is the thing: is even if it's, I don't appreciate a a wild look at normalcy, whatever Baby Driver is. Yeah. But I. But at the same time, he made a good movie. It wasn't a bad movie. Just not. Not what I had hoped for, I guess, maybe. I don't know what it, what well, it is, I'm saying. Well, and here's, you know, another thing. Like, uh, I read an interview where Christopher Nolan's like, you know, you know, like, I don't read reviews. You know, and and and, 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 and my uh, my feeling was, uh, you know, like, oh, you know, I should be offended because I'm a reviewer. But, you know, I'm not offended. I don't want filmmakers to, you know, read my reviews. Not that I even think that, you know, any of them are because, you know, I'm... You're just a lowly, you know, aspiring. If they are, they if they are, they have a, they have a lot more a lot more issues to deal with. But yeah, but I want them to do their own thing. Yeah, and that certainly includes you know someone with the talent and the resume of Edgar Wright. Yes, there is one more thing I want to say about Joseph, and that yes, is something yeah. that I brought this in. Um, this is an article from Birth, Death, Movies, uh, written by Adam uh, Membre, I think his name was. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Adam Membre. 
who is partially deaf, who is uh, and who is a teacher for students with special needs. Okay. And he talked about how much it it meant to him to have uh, Joseph, played by C.J. Jones, a deaf actor who has made a career on uh, doing performances about how to not, how deaf people interact with the world. And he wrote an article about how much it means to see a deaf, a black deaf actor on screen. And I just want to read a piece of it. Uh, yeah, yeah. Baby Driver brings a new wrinkle to the deaf hearing relationships we see on film. We know that Baby has tinnitus and is adopted by Joseph, an older deaf black man who rarely leaves the apartment. They share an easy rapport. And if you ever hear anyone say, how can you tell the difference between... It, how can you tell the difference if the hearing actor learns sign... Show them any conversation Baby and Joseph have over and over and over again. As someone who uses sign for work and conversation, I can absolutely tell that Baby has learned it and Joseph knows it. The difference is unmistakable, and yet it never threatens to unravel or burden the conversation. If anything, it frees it. It gives it meaning. Baby is just as musical in his conversation with Joseph as he is dancing around the apartment to Deborah. That's great. That's... That's really interesting. And that struck me as interesting. That did strike me as interesting. I, this may be the first time that a featured role has been given to in a major studio picture to a black deaf actor. Sure. And it's just, it, it does mean something. Uh, seeing him on screen and seeing the way he signs and the way like it's someone described in in the article. He says that it seems like. The way C.J. Jones took the script, he kind of rejiggered some of it. He rejiggered some of the words to suit his signing better. And that shows. It shows how, like, his ease and his comfort with doing it. And it's... It plays really well. I thought it played really well. Um, well, and also, yeah. isn't that kind of an actor's job? Is I mean, someone could write something, and then it's like... But then you get someone who comes in, they're like, they read it, and they go, Oh... I'm going to play it this way. And then they go, hey, I like how you played that. So that is interesting. I mean, that's basically what an actor does. Yeah. Sure. Acting is even, choices. Even if, it's, even if it's signing, it's how you choose to sign or how you choose to say it or yeah. do it. Uh. Well, and you bring up a, a great point because, you know, I mean, you know, how many, you know, you know, deaf characters can you think of in movies? You know, I can, you know... Children think, of a lesser god. I can think you know, of... Whatever well, Marley Madeline's there. Yeah. Well, you know, I can think of like, uh, you know... Rinko Kikuchi's character in Babylon, and that character, you know, because of uh, the way uh, Alejandro and Yaru directed that movie, is basically just a sex object, and you know, so that's that's you know, I I hadn't thought of that, but that's pretty. Yeah, I was, that's I was pretty, like, there's, that's, I was like, there's a little, I think there's a little more to it than that. I I, I don't think so. <laughs> I'm, not, but, I'm but, not a big fan of that movie <laughs> as well, but I will, I I would possibly argue against that. But it's been a few years, if, and also if, I don't care enough. I just if, saw it. <laughs> it. I mean, if, if, if we have that argument, this, I, gosh, I'm going to eat up the whole podcast. Time and place, comment. guys. Time but, and um, place. But, uh, but, 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 I mean, you, you know, I honestly, like, hadn't, you know, thought about the implications of, like, you know, you know Joseph in those terms, but, but what a, I mean, what a great point. That's, yeah. that's so true, and that's a it's, big it's, thing in the movie, this mainstream. Too. It's it's a really great article. It's at Birth Death Movies. Uh, go look it up if you want to read it. Check it out. Well, I got one more question uh, for you guys. Uh, I, I was uh, we're gonna go into spoiler territory here, but I was <laughs> uh, but I was thinking about the uh, the ending of the film, and I think uh, you know it on the surface you could say it's you know a typical happy ending, but there's there's a lot going on there so I was, I was wondering if you guys you know, wanted to talk about what you made of the ending and what it really says about the whole journey of, uh, of Baby in the film itself it is once again very much leaning into the fantasy um, it's, it's the notion that he goes through all this stuff he does all these things and the good deeds he peppered in along the way are enough that he's able to get out of jail in five years um, and that uh, Deborah's still waiting for him there, even though she barely knows him, even though he put her through all this hell. 
um, who, even though he probably made her an accessory to various criminal acts. <laughs> a little bit. That's a, a, that's a fair point. I just made a hand gesture. <laughs> I, should, I should say something with this hand gesture. Just teensy bit, teensy bit. Just a little bit. She, like, she was ready to drive through Georgia State Troopers for him. <laughs> um, oh, yikes. But it's... I, I don't think it holds up entirely, um, the very end of it. Uh, I like I like part of it. I like the, just the line he says, you don't belong in this world, to her when, they, when they're about to be taken in, because that's the same thing Joseph said to him to try and get him to quit being a driver. Oh, interesting. Um, but it's, it doesn't hold up completely for me. It felt Not very. Too clean. It felt. I was gonna say. It felt like kind of like. Eh, we'll just put a bow on that. I was like, I almost would have. I think I would have maybe just rather the movie ended with, you know, he's up for parole in five years, and then just kind of left it at that. Or, but maybe with the 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 letters that she's writing him, I would have liked to have gone, huh. I wonder if he was still there or, like, did he get out in five years? I feel like just that last sequence, it could have been cut off and just been like, I would have been fine. I'm no, most, but most mainstream audiences are not like me, and some of them can't handle endings like that, like my mother. <laughs> Wait, does he get out? Is she going to still be waiting for him? I don't know, says my dad, and she goes, well, that was dumb. I can't believe I watched the whole movie for that. <laughs> That is uh, that is my mother describing most <laughs> movies now. I can't believe it just ended like that. <laughs> I just I think they should have shown them. Do they at least get together? <laughs> so, anyways, that's but that's how I felt. I like I felt like I most of his movies kind of end with a a what if. He doesn't really. I mean, sure, Simon Pegg's character is now has Nick Frost's character chained up in the in the shed, and he just <laughs> lives there. <laughs> but you're still going. Wait, movie. is that just his life now? Like, like it just ends that way. Like you're still left with like, you're like, here's it's the a answer. Bit of a shock, yeah. Like it's more like here's the answer, but I mean, I'm not going to be like, oh, by the way, and we all lived happily ever after. It's more like, and here we are. Or but. We also had Scott and Ramona walk it off into the sunset. Oh, yeah. But that one... Which I, I, I quite like. But I was going to say, but that cliche, you, again, it comes back to that whole, and they walked off into the sunset. Like, With the current turn girl. You know, yeah, like, uh, I feel like, I feel like it, again... Such a it, great ending. It, but that kind of solidifies Ben's point from earlier of, if he's going to do something like, here it is, it's almost tongue-in-cheek a little yeah. bit. Yeah, and. Yeah. But he's aware of that, again, in on the joke. So. Yeah. But again, I, I, that was just my opinion. I, I'm like you guys care. <laughs> I, I, I care. Oh, I definitely good. care. And I'm, in fact, I'm gonna, gonna echo both of what you guys are saying. I am, uh, for me, one of the most interesting parts of the movie is, you know, uh, you know what you were talking about, Mo, with the, the, the good deeds, you know, and, and like, you know, in court, like people like saying, um, uh, uh, you know, like, like all these things, like he, he, he did, he did this, you know, it's like, and it's like, you know, like, wait a second. You know, he, he robs a woman, at, he, he steals her car at gunpoint, but she feels, it, but, but she, but her, but what she takes of that is, he gave me my purse back. <laughs> and I was kind of, I was kind of he thinking. He killed two people, but he gave me my purse back. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I was, I was kind of like, and I, I, again, there was an opportunity for a really funny joke there that was missed, but I, I thought like, this is a movie that wants to have it, you know, both ways. It wants to have, you know, have him have the fun of being a criminal, but it wants to romanticize him and, you know, paint him as this kind of saintly character. And, and you know, uh, I'm going to talk about Drive and Bonnie and Clyde now, and I don't want to sound like a hypocrite. I like this movie more than I like Drive. I'll just say it. I was like, <laughs> oh, I was like, boo! I was like, oh, yeah, I think, boo. I think Baby Driver will be better a second time, or will be good a second time. Drive is not. It oh, oh, hold up over I, several viewings. Oh, oh. Totally disagree. I take this from someone who's seen Drive like ten times. But um, uh, yeah, but here's here's the thing. You know, I don't, I don't want to be a hypocrite because Drive and Bonnie and Clyde romanticized you know criminals as well. But here's the thing. You know, like uh, you know, those movies had the honesty to kind of follow their characters' actions to their logical conclusions. You know, at the end of uh, Bonnie and Clyde, you know, they rob a bunch of banks and then they get shot up in the middle of the road. And it's still a really fun movie, Whoa, by the way. Oh, spoilers! <laughs> yeah, decades old spoiler alert. <laughs> uh, Drive, uh, you know, he, uh, he he saves Carrie Mulligan, but in uh, the the process, you know, he becomes a monster because he 
kills a guy in front of her and she can never look at him the same way again. And he has to go, you know, the, the price of saving her is, you know, going off on his own. And, you know, uh, we're not going to go down this road, but come on, Drive was the best movie of 2011. <laughs> but, uh, I can't but, remember what else came out in 2011. But, uh, but, first Class was there, right? <laughs> what, what? X-Men First, 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 first Class. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, I think Tintin was that year, too. Tintin oh, was okay. that year, too. Yeah. Tintin was yeah. de probably not better than, the first, uh, better than Drive. I like Tintin. I don't want a sequel to that. But, um, uh, uh, it still might happen. Dude. We'll see. Uh, Peter but... Jackson is like half a dozen irons <laughs> in the fire, man. That's true. He's almost but, um, worse uh, than Guillermo del Toro. But I was, I don't know, I was, I was frustrated with the ending, because I thought, you know, I mean, you know, all, you know, so many movies romanticize criminals. Even The Godfather, which is really hard-hitting, does to a degree, because you're still enraptured with the, kind of, the Shakespearean grandeur of the family drama, and I just feel like there was an opportunity here to, you know, poke a little fun at that, you know, <laughs> romanticizing of these types of characters. And it, it was missed. It was missed. It flew right by him. And honestly, maybe that's why this is the highest grossing film of his career. Because it's the uh, the most accessible, you know, and... Well, maybe he's trying to make that switch. Uh, maybe he's trying to dial it back a little bit. Uh, yeah, and this, and, like I mean, this going, might just yeah. be... There might this might be the movie, and there will probably be one more. If that's the direction he's going, he'll probably have to do at least another movie in along the same like traditional roads, and then go by his third one. He'll figure it out or tone it or dial it in, and he'll go. This is what it is. That was what Spielberg did up until Schindler's List. He was the he was like the guy you go to to like bring people in. It wasn't that his movies were bad, but you're like, oh, everyone's gonna go see Indiana Jones. Everyone's gonna go see. Hook, like, you know, you could just, like, oh, bring in Steven Spielberg. It'll bring people in. But then he does Schindler's List, and they're like, oh, he's a serious filmmaker now. Like, that's, like, that's that could be that point. Maybe that's what he's trying to do. He's just like, I don't want to be the fun, ridiculous director. I mean, me, I would love to be the fun, I, ridiculous <laughs> director. But he's got this exact precision, and maybe he wants to do something else with it. Well, you know, and, uh, you know, arguably, Edgar Wright and Steven Spielberg are both living proof of the idea that kind of, the fun director and the serious director are really, you know, kind of the same thing. Because, you know, like, a, you know, I mean, I mean, Edgar Wright, you know, he's got to be a serious thinker to make something this precise. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean. It's, I mean. Like you, you get to the, the, like, the last part of The World's End and you see that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah. that's, The World's yeah. End is, that was, I mean, just how precise that, he goes, this is it, he goes, that's when I got it, he goes, that's the shot. Because I think that's what they said. They're like, whenever he said he got it, he got it. Like up until that point, he didn't. And he goes, and that's whatever he says, that's it. Because that's the one he generally uses. Like, mm. and so he knows exactly what he's looking for, and he knows exactly what he wants it to do. And so he's an amazing director. He is. Yeah. And I think it's I think it's actually cool because I don't generally watch the Fast and the Furious movies and go. Look at how precise this is. <laughs> uh, but with Edgar Wright, I'm like, God, everything is like, hits bullseye every time. And he goes, and I don't shoot it unless he's going to make it exact. And I think that's impressive. I think, I think the takeaway from that is I, I think uh, one thing we'll definitely all agree on is that we're looking forward to what he does next. Oh, yeah. Whatever yeah. it may be. Well, it's, it's, he's, according to Wikipedia, their next up is an adaptation of uh, Neil Gaiman's children's book. Starring, uh, I think he's co-writing the script with Brett McKenzie from Fly the Conqueror. Oh, is, is that Shadows? Or... Uh, Fortunately, The Milk. Fortunately, The Milk. Or that might be a different one. And then he's talking about, like, Grasshopper and, and Jungle. Then, or, and then or something with Johnny Depp too. in the lead. Oh, okay. Which does not sound super great. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't sound great. But this is the thing is, I would actually love to see Johnny Depp under Edgar Wright's eye. I would like to not see Johnny Depp as much anymore. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I, but honestly, this is the thing is, I know that Johnny Depp could be a really good actor. He just needs... Oh, but, yeah. And it's interesting to see him take on the vision of the director he works with. Sure. I just need... Uh, but the problem is he keeps going back with the same director, so I'm seeing nothing new. I think uh, just like seeing Jamie Foxx through the eye of Edgar Wright, or John Hamm through the eye of Edgar Wright. Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, well, seeing that is just a reminder that, yeah, John Hamm is still a good actor. Well. Like, he's been doing comedy a bunch for, her, like, the past few years. He's been he's been on uh, Kimmy Schmidt, and he's been doing 30 Rock and SNL and stuff. Yeah, but. But, no, he's still a good actor. He's a, he's a good actor, and I think it's, I mean, I, I always think of 30 Rock John Hamm, because I've never seen Mad Men. And <laughs> I've never so seen it either. So that's <laughs> the most familiar John Hamm I have. 
But this is not the same one, and so I, and I think it has everything to do with Edgar Wright. I think any of the actors you look at, Kevin Spacey doing Edgar Wright. No, it's it's definitely John Hamm. And like so, I'm just I'm just thinking back to the scene where he where he comes into the diner and they're playing Barry White <laughs> when they see him, and it's like all the tension diffuses because it's Barry White. <laughs> like we're supposed to be threatened by that, and then John Hamm starts acting, and he is so threatening just being there that is that's and, is, and yeah the tension comes right back he does he's he does a good job on this one so yeah. I, I so even though yeah i'm not a big fan of johnny depp i think seeing what edgar wright gets johnny depp to do will be interesting mm. well let's um uh, let's move on to uh some other stuff uh, other stuff other stuff, other other stuff. stuff. And, and, and in fact we're going to move on some uh, some to some big stuff and some sick stuff Literally, you guys just saw the big sick. We did. Woo! I didn't see it. It was romantic. Tell, <laughs> tell me, tell, tell, tell me about uh, the the big sick. I'm, I'm going to see it, uh, so you don't have to convince me. But, but tell me, am I in for a good time? Yes, you are. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, I'm not big into romantic comedies. I, I think that's just, I don't know why. It's just never been my bag. Um, but this is a good romantic comedy. This is funny, and it's got a lot of heart into. In it, uh, it's well acted. It's decent enough directed. It's 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 worth seeing. It's a good movie. Cool. Uh, Max, I loved it. I thought Kamal Kamal Nanjiani Nanjiani did a great. I'm very bad at his last name. Uh, he so did it, so is my Alexa. <laughs> <laughs> like I, I, I tried to be like, okay, find Kamal Nanjiani. She it, it had no idea what I was talking about. <laughs> I uh, but. He did a great job. I love the story. I'm not usually. I haven't been a really. I haven't seen anything Zoe Kazan has done that has really blown me away. But I liked her in this, and it feels very real, and which is good because it's based. Like I think the story, the idea is already like kind of like out there in the sense of like, wait, this happened. So, but so everything has to be very like you know, like dialed into reality, and it felt very real, even. Down from Holly Hunter losing her shit on some <laughs> guy in in a club, or uh, you know Ray Romano, you know trying trying his best to like you know make a good point. Like you're just like oh he's you know, this he feels like someone's dad. It all felt very real, and that felt nice, especially when you're also dealing with stand up comics as well. So uh, it was good. I really liked it a lot. Well. Let, let's. Uh, I, the question I have for you guys is: Go for it. Whenever I tell people I want to see the big sick, uh, that uh, I, I I don't get such a good reaction because you know it's like you know the you know because the title sounds like it's a movie about vomit. You know, well, but, um, but the, and, the then I, and then I say, side. and then I say, no, no, I'm, I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's going to be you know a, a charming, you know, interesting, moving film. Is is it uh, is it charming, is it charming moving yeah. and interesting? Yes. Yes. I think uh, I think it's uh, I mean it's based on him and how his wife got together. And right. Right. It's uh, and they co-wrote it. They co-wrote together. it together, which I think is great. Uh, yeah, it's very charming. Uh, I think it'll remind you of your family. It definitely rings true for a man of a certain age, like what he's going through, and yeah, in. But also, it's an experience that most of us don't understand. Uh, but they make it relatable. Like exactly. There's, there's the specific cultural touchstones there that it's relatable. Um, it's uh, he's he's uh, supposed to be praying five times a day, <laughs> and he's not. He does not pray. Like he just goes and, into his garage and watches stuff on YouTube for five minutes, and then the comes out. <laughs> and then, but then there's also you know him. His mother really wants him to marry a Pakistani woman, and. Mm -hmm. Invites over dates every week to their family dinner. They're just like it's always a surprise. I mean, you know, <laughs> so it's like even though you don't deal with arranged marriages, we all had that mom was like, oh, I wonder who's at the door. <laughs> that maybe Natalie more than you ever would want them to, and they have different ideals than you want or than you have, and you don't know if that's what you want. And so it's very relatable, even though I have, did not have a very traditional Pakistani upbringing. <laughs> By a very, by a, by very traditional, I mean none at all. But <laughs> like my favorite, and this is this is a little bit of a spoiler. Um, I won't go into too much detail. But one of my favorite elements is that he has a one man show. 
mm-hmm. that he does every so often. And we see we see bits of it like at the beginning of the movie and at the end. And at the beginning, it's basically just a lecture on the history of Pakistan and the culture of Pakistan. Mm-hmm. And that's it. And it's just about this is what it's like growing up in Pakistan. These are the this is the history of the country. These are the rules of how to play cricket. Mm-hmm. Da, 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 da. And he's trying to make it funny, and it's not because it's just relaying it's a history lesson. It's mm-hmm. a history lesson, and then, and and he shows it to uh, to Zoe Zoe Kazan's character, and at and afterwards she said, "I thought it was informational. In, informational. I I didn't know her hear a lot about you in it though." And he like he doesn't say anything. He just kind of scribbles something down. And then we see the impact of that later in the movie. And it's it makes a world of difference. And it's kind of... the That was the part that was most interesting to me, which I guess, you know, again, I'm, I'm not big into romantic comedies, but the way he relates to his culture, where it's just kind of... At, at the beginning of the movie, it's just this monolithic thing. It's just mm-hmm. this thing that he has to observe and be reverent toward. And he doesn't necessarily have a personal stake in it beyond his family it's just like it's something he goes through the motions of is acknowledging pakistani culture and then by the end it's something else he has a different way of relating to it because of the things he's gone through because of these experiences and that to me was interesting well that's that sounds like a pretty radical you know thing for a romantic comedy because <laughs> it's, it, it's, it's not it's not at the forefront but it's definitely there but like, still you have to even be in there because you know when we think you know romantic comedies those aren't the kinds of journeys we think think of them and you know to well i mean romantic comedies are you know like you know most genres really you know pretty white so that's that's, that sounds that sounds pretty exciting to to see to see that in in this genre well what it is what is exciting is that it i mean most romantic comedies, they have very bland characters for a reason. It's like, you can't make it too specific. If it's too specific, someone might not want to watch it. Or they won't get it because they didn't go through something like that. So it has to be very bland. So Which is funny because the truth is that the more specific things are, the more relatable they are. Exactly. Right? And that's what makes it a better movie, is that okay. it is specific to this one person's experience. And it's not just, oh... I fell in love with someone and then they went into a coma. Like that could have easily been any romantic comedy. Like, but this one is different because it actually happened. It's it's one person's experience, and even though to it's most experience. most of America's, it's not any of our experience ever. Like even at the core values, you go, but what it's you go, oh, but its specificity is what makes it interesting, and when it's interesting, it's good, hmm. and it's fun. It, it's almost even funnier because. It's very specific. <laughs> yeah, and and just, just it, it, it feels more fresh because it's different in that way. Like I, I think there was, there's definitely been not necessarily a surge, but there's been an increase in voices from Muslim Americans mm-hmm. uh, recently, and one of them is Master of None, which is one of the best shows on Netflix. It's so good. So Aziz, uh, I'm sorry. Aziz, though, right? I'm sorry. Um, he he put together he put it together. Um, and he talked like he was accepting an award, and I for it was either him or his co-writer Alan Yang uh, talking about it, and I th- and the line, the line the, like in their acceptance speech, it was something like "Thank you Hollywood for making things so bland and so white that us <laughs> simply doing the same thing comes off as revolutionary," <laughs> <laughs> and. It's, they're kind of right. Like, it's, someone described uh, Master of None as a Woody Allen movie starring people Woody Allen would never cast. <laughs> wow. Um, but it's good. It's good. And a, a, another one, um, I just want to talk about this real quick, because it, yeah. I saw it earlier this year, it's really good, is, on, it's also on Netflix, it's Hassan Minaj, who's on The Daily Show, his stand-up special, Homecoming King, mm-hmm. uh, which is just, it's about his life and being Indian American and Muslim American in uh, Davis, California, which is predominantly white. And it's funny, and it's personal, and it also gets really sad and heartbreaking at times. Like, he, he talks about an experience <coughs> in high school where it was... Uh, he, him and this girl were kind of dating, but not really. Like, they would study together a lot. They liked each other, clearly. And he asked her to prom, and she says yes. And so, 
he goes to he went to ask his his parents if he could go to prom. They said no, that he couldn't go to prom with a white girl. And so he in, decides he's going to sneak out. He goes to her house to take her to prom, and then when he goes there, she's there with a white guy, and and her parents are there and they say. Yeah, we're going to be taking some pictures and sending them to her family back home in Texas. And we're Ooh. a little worried about how it would look her going to prom with you. Oh, God. And it's like, yeah. That's <laughs> like cool. that's, 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 that's stomach that's terrible. That's heartbreaking. Yeah, yeah. And he, go, and he has stories like that. And it's very raw and very upfront. But he take but... He does it with with a sense of of humor and a sense of energy, and you know things turn out all right for him, and it it works out okay. Um, so that was me going off on a tangent, but uh, no, that that's that's power. Uh, that's such, that's powerful stuff. Though. I, I uh, home, homecoming king. Too, right? Yes, homecoming king Hassan Minaj. Okay, I'm gonna um, check it out. Yeah, so that's the. Uh, that's something I've noticed as of late, um, and I re I do hope that trend continues because that is that's something that interests me is these kind of stories not not just of immigrants, um, mm -hmm. or, but even people who grew up who were born in the states and grew up but surrounded by a different culture than the rest of us. Sure, that's sure. interesting to me, and I I there that's really fertile ground for storytelling. The Mindy Whoa. Project is really good with that too, and I think it's even that one's even really good because you go. This person, Mindy Kaling, is just like most vapid American women, regardless of her skin color, skin tone or who her parents are and how she was raised. And she's a doctor. Like, like it's like two things. It's like, oh God, you do not like you don't eat well. You know only celebrity gossip. You know nothing about the world history or the news that's going on. But you're also a doctor, and you just deliver babies. Like so, so she's kind of. I think it's a really interesting character, and I love the Mindy Project. And she has a great. She has a line in the writers' room. He goes, "Must be true to the character." You're like you can put them in any crazy situation that you want, but your character can't all of a sudden, you know, have a peanut allergy if they were eating a peanut butter, you know, a few seasons ago. Like they have, like in that, like it's like, or they have to react the way that they would in that situation. Like you, but otherwise. Put them in whatever situation you want, and I think it's brilliant. <laughs> you guys both bring up uh, TV, and you know it's a reminder uh, yet again that that Hollywood is lagging behind. A little bit. <laughs> there's, a, there's, a, there's a long but way they to go, can but, change, but, but yeah. hopefully, you know, maybe the the big sick is is a is a is a harbinger. It's a good yeah, turning point. Mm. Are there any other uh, movies uh, you guys uh, want to talk about? I know. Uh, you saw Spider Man? Did you see Spider Man? Though? I have not yet. Okay, um, I got out to see Spider Man today. Actually, uh, got it came what, out a few days think? ago. I thought it was very fun, which I think is what Spider Man should be. Right. Uh, I I don't want to say too much more than sure. that. Uh, I guess I would say I really liked. Uh, I really liked. Uh, crap, I can't remember his name. Michael Keaton as Vulture. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. he did a good job, and I think. You know what? I recently read something that Feige said that they're like, well, what are you going to do after Infinity War? That thing, how could you top that? He goes, our goal is to not top it at all. He goes, <laughs> he goes that's he probably goes, smart. Well, you, you have a big giant purple dude fighting a bunch of movie stars. Well, and it's going to take you want two to movies back. to tell it. As he said, he goes, he goes, well, I think what we've been seeing a lot lately is, you know, you get Captain America and Black Widow together. Like, them like them going back and forth, putting certain Avengers together that wouldn't normally go together. He goes. Sure. Later we got you know Hulk and Thor on an adventure. He goes. He goes. Right now we've built up a repertoire of so many people. He goes. It would be more. He goes. I think it'll be more interesting because when you can't top something is to just kind of put the different pieces together and see how they fit. And you know he goes. And now we have enough characters we can do that. And so I think Spider Man gives a great example of what's to come as well. Because it's him and Iron Man, and more so Happy Hogan. He uh, played by John Favreau. Yeah, like yeah. he has a lot of interplay in that, and I think more than I think uh, Iron Man does. And so, and I think that's kind of cool that we're that it'll be a good like an idea of what's to come, hopefully for the future, which is just a character dealing with one main problem and how he plays off with the people in the world around him. Sure, and yeah. I think they do a really good job with that. Well, and there was a part that maybe some people saw coming that I did not. 
I won't say what it is. The, the last. No, scene. just uh, no, not even I that. Seen it. Okay. No, okay. I'm not saying anything. I was just like, there was this one part I was like, <laughs> what? I was like, oh, I bet you so many other people saw that. Kind of <laughs> I was like, I felt bad that I like I didn't. And I was like, I see movies for a living. <laughs> okay, as a very serious hobby. <laughs> Yeah, this this is an interesting. Uh, int this is movie is an interesting deal. I mean, uh, it's uh, <coughs> it, it's it's definitely a lot better than the Amazing Spider-Man Two. It's not yes. and, 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 yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 that's true. And it's it's like you know, it's uh, it's you know, dialed in. It's very it's it's very it's very neat. It's very uh, uh, clean. It's it's not uh, messy. It's 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 not you know boring. It's it's spirited. I I wasn't taken with it. Personally, more because I, I mean, I was, uh, I, I felt like I was, uh, for me, it, it, it kind of lacked a reason to care. Like, uh, for me, I just, I didn't, I didn't have that, that feeling I, I had, you know, with the Tobey Maguire films where I, I really, you know, rooted for Peter Parker and like, you know, really like, you know, like cared whether he lived or died and was on the edge of my seat and, you know, you know, cheering for him and, you know, weeping for him and, you know, you know, you know, Staring in wonder when he swung through the you know between skyscrapers like it's it's, I, it's a little it's a little placid. You but know? this is the thing though is that I feel like the Tobey Maguire Spider Man that you're given is more of a look at this guy he's you know in high school and now he has to deal with some very serious stuff like you know yeah. he wants to be a superhero that comes with consequences and that comes with struggles and that's what you're learning about and I think Marvel was like the problem so is what, like, what you're saying is. That with great power, oh boy, there oh, must also come responsibility. Don't even great stick. responsibility. So, but I think Mar and tights. But I think Marvel this time around was like they're like, hey, Spider Man's in high school. We want it to feel like that. And I think he's like without like being like patronizing in a weird way. And I think they really do that. You go, oh sure, he's Spider Man. He's a superhero. He wants to be part of the Avengers. But Homecoming is also coming up soon, so, you know, there's also that. Or, like, he wants to impress the girl that he thinks is really cute, and I think, so, and I think you, there's potential to head towards that direction of, of Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man, of dealing with things that are maybe beyond what most of us should have to deal with at an earlier age. But right now, they kind of want him to be a kid. They also don't want to deal with any, they're like... Sure, Green Goblin's cool, but, you know, we want to deal with some new people we haven't seen because we've got so many to play sure. with. Yeah. And so I yeah. think they were, the, I think, I think they were like, we want him to seem younger, but at the same time, we're also going to avoid some very big plot holes or, you know, big problems. And I think Andrew Garfield, they were like, we wanted it to be playful, but they also wanted it to be serious and also we need to sell tickets and... We don't know what we're doing with Spider Man. It was that was that Spider Man? So we have one serious Spider Man. I think we're gonna get the fun Spider Man. Well, here's uh, I I I think I'll I, say I'll say I'll say one more thing about this. I don't really agree that this is uh, the the serious Spider Man versus the fun Spider Man because the the Tobey Maguire films those films had tons of humor. I mean, the scene of you know Spider Man in the elevator in his costume, like it's talking to the guy. It's a who different thinks, brand of humor. Yeah, yeah. and, and so so for me, we got we got a Spider Man that was you know everything that Spider Man is: the tragedy, you know, the comedy, the the drama. And now for me, we're getting a Spider Man that is leaning so hard into the lighter side that we don't even mention Uncle Ben's name. And I'm not saying. That Spider Man has to be, you know, dark and sad all the time, but rather I think you can have both. And I feel like when you get to the point where you don't even mention Uncle Ben's name, you know, I, I mean I mean to me, this is who Spider Man is. You know, he is a guy who makes a terrible mistake and says, I can never stand by again because, you know, like any time I stand by, you know, and don't do anything, you know, that mistake will be repeated. And for me, like that's like why you care I when he's in action. And the thing but is I think and the, we'll but, 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 wait, just a sec, just a sec. The thing, but the thing is, you know, like, you know, so if we're not leaning into that, if we're not acknowledging that, if we're not, if we're almost basically pretending Uncle Ben doesn't exist, then how is Spider-Man any different than any other at wise cracking action hero? You know, like, why should, you know, we root for him, you know, any more, you know, than we would, you know, root for, you know, the, the average, you know, this is a bad example, but it's just the first off the top of my head, you know, Keanu Reeves character, you know, and... And I always loved Spider-Man because I felt he was something more. And it, like it, 
it felt like something was at stake. You but know? this, but that's the thing is, we know what happened to Uncle Ben. But like, but, but here's the thing. That's the point. They, they were like, we don't need to do this anymore. Here's Just the like thing. how many times here's do you need thing. to see Bruce Wayne's father or parents die? Here's the thing, though. And we can get there. You never, you can never take for granted, you know, you know all this uh, this background knowledge. And one great thing that Sam Raimi did, you know, with the original Spider-Man trilogy was he said, you know, okay. You know, like, like I'm not going to replay everything over and over again, but with the opening credits, I'm going to, you know, kind of recap what happened in the past few movies to orient people, you know, so, you know, they are in the emotional state and, like, understand where Peter Parker is emotionally. And to me, just to kind of wipe the slate clean and, you know, like, oh, Spider-Man's a cheerful, bouncy guy who eats <laughs> churros, you know, he's not sad at all, you know, his uncle died, but there's no grief, you know, he just wants to impress Tony Stark and fight, you know, in yeah. big Avengers battles. It's like... It's like, okay, that's fine, but don't lean in that at the expense of the other stuff, which is the soul of the character. I, well. I get that. I think, I, if I'm guessing what Marvel's play here is, it's just to remind people that good Spider-Man movies can still be made, which doesn't really feel necessary since, you know, the last good Spider-Man movie was, I don't know, 2007? And yes, yeah. I'm counting Spider-Man 3. Um, I, I count Spider-Man 3 too, thank you. And I do not care to hear any dissenting opinions. Um, <laughs> but it, it's, <laughs> and it's, you know, the Marvel experiment has worked because they're willing to tap into different genres. Like, it's all under the superhero umbrella, but there's variations. You know, you got uh, sci-fi comedy with Iron Man, or you got uh, high fantasy with Thor, and here we have a high school movie. So yeah. it's yeah. going to be lighter. It's going to be on the... on the less serious side of things. Um, I'm okay with that. I'm, I'd like to see Spider-Man get remakes. Um, I'm prob I'm gonna, I might try to see it later tonight. Uh, but, um, I get what you're saying. It, it, there is, that element of tragedy is as much a, to the core of Spider-Man as the high-flying adventure, as the jokes, as the teenage soap opera. So, and also, like, we're coming off of uh, Civil War, where, like, everything was sad and it had a downer ending. Yes. And sure. so, yeah, maybe we need to be cheered up. Well, here's, I'll, I'll, I'll say this, and believe it or not, I'm going to say something kind of conciliatory about Spider-Man. Um, uh, but, uh, you, you know, I, I mean, you know, I, you know, have, you know, this idea of who the character is. And yeah. I will defend that idea until I'm a cranky old man in a nursing <laughs> home with Alzheimer's, you know, back in my day, Toby McGuire, uh, he was the one, you know, but, um, but then again, I reckon it. I'm not the only Spider-Man fan of the universe. And, you know, some people, and you know, some people, around for 50 years. Yeah. yeah. Some people, you know, uh, Tom Holland is their favorite. You know, you know, some people, uh, uh, even Andrew Garfield is their favorite. Go figure. Um, uh, but, uh, so I, I mean, you know, you know, I, Again, I'll you know defend my interpretation of the character because I think it's the right one and I think it's the most loyal to the comics. But then again, it's not my myth; it's everybody's myth. And you know, if you know, we have a spot. We have if we get a ver versions of Spider-Man that kind of you know speak to each of the quadrants of fans. You know, well, that's that's what it's all about. Yeah. Because it's the point. That's the point of this kind of thing. I think to you know these mythologies to bring us together. You know. Yeah, I I will say. I will agree with you on that. Maybe not Tobey Maguire. <laughs> <laughs> uh, don't 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 say anything. Anymore. That's you'll all get, I'm gonna get, say. I'll leave started. it at that. <laughs> Tobey Maguire is the best Spider-Man of all time. Oh, okay, we're moving on. Oh, I'm, but, I'm, I'm just I'm just waiting for the Miles Morales movie so I can rub Tremeek Moore in all y'all's faces. There we go. <laughs> I want I want I want that to be live action. I mean, I'm, I'm, here, I'm down for animation. I love animation. I'm here for that, man. This <laughs> it's it's gonna be good though. I think I'm yeah. down for it. Yeah. I'm down for like we got Lord and Miller producing it. We got a killer supporting cast: Leah Schreiber, Mahershala I Ali, Leah Schreiber. Ryan Tyree yeah. Henry. That's insane! I'm here for it, man. That's cool. Bring it That's on! Cool. I love me some Miles Morales. Um, any other movies? Uh, have you seen anything? You want I've to seen a lot of movies. I'm not remembering them <laughs> because I think most of them I've already written reviews for, or we've already talked about. Um, I, I saw a Rough Night. That was fun. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, oh fun. oh oh. Go for it. Can can we make fun of the book of Henry? For we a can absolutely make fun of the book of Henry. Have you seen the book of Henry, Max? No. Oh my! Uh, it's so bad. Can, can, can I can can I just 
recap it. Oh, just please the hell do. are we talking about? Okay, this um, uh, oh, I, I love to see people's reactions. Uh, to uh, this. The, the, the Book of Henry is a film from uh, Colin Trevorrow, the visionary director of Jurassic World, <laughs> and uh, but it's a uh, but it, it's about a uh, a precocious child genius played by Jaden Lieberherr, uh, with uh, an alcoholic mother, played by Naomi Watts, but because this is a church movie, alcoholic. yeah, they never acknowledge that she's an alcoholic, she obviously is, but they never acknowledge it, because this movie is like, you know, an inspirational, precocious child fantasy, you know, and it's like, you know, it's all like quirky at the beginning, and then it's like, he sees uh, uh, the, uh, the Dean Norris's character next door abusing his daughter, and then it becomes like, this little boy is a vigilante, and he's gonna figure out, um, uh, you know, where to buy a gun so he can kill the guy. <laughs> what? And then, and and then, um, uh, and then, uh, wait, wait, wait. Then for it. he gets a brain tumor, and then <laughs> what? You think he's the main character, but and I'm just gonna spoil it because whatever. And then he terrible. dies in his mother arm, his mother's arms, and says. I want to see the sky. <laughs> and then the movie becomes about how the mother takes up the quest and tries to fulfill her 11-year-old son's plan to shoot and kill uh, Dean Norris next door. <laughs> I mean, this is, this is the worst movie of the year. This sounds like this a is, dream this I, I would have. That I would go... This sounds better in theory than I think it will actually be. It this, doesn't even sound good in theory. I know. <laughs> and Colin Trevorrow, he tweeted after this, you know, uh, you know, be proud of everything you paint, even if mom doesn't hang it on the fridge. And it's like, okay, I appreciate the metaphor, but don't be proud of this. This movie is offensive to children. It's offensive to mothers. It's offensive to people, you know, going through uh, grief. And frankly, it's offensive to intelligent human beings, you know, who, uh, you know, go to see movies at all. It's, Whoa. I think, I get the sense that, like, who's the writer on it? Brian? Uh, Greg, Greg Hurwitz. Greg Hurwitz. Um, I get the sense that Greg Hurwitz, on some level, wanted to do a subversion of, like, this idea of, like, the precocious child genius kind of thing, but Colin Trevorrow didn't, and he plays it straight, and it just, it falls apart. Oy. It is, it is embarrassing. It sounds terrible. It's... It's an interesting kind of bad. Like it's, it's a fascinating kind it's, of bad. It's a passion project from someone who couldn't see the cracks. Yeah, it, it's 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 a it's a really like a, you know it, don't get me wrong like this is like you know this like, is a very pure movie you know but but unlike but unlike you know Baby Driver it's like okay well I didn't personally like it but it's a pure vision and I can respect that this is a pure vision that's like you know like wow Colin Trevorrow you know your you know pure unadulterated creative impulses are really damn ugly, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yes. Like, I would rather watch this movie than Pirates 5 again, because Pirates 5 was just boring. <laughs> like, this is yeah, just like... that's true. What were that's, you thinking? That's, that's, yeah, yeah. Did you not step back and think, like, do we need to... Like, one of the moments that just, like, encapsulates this weird kind of, like, subject versus style clash, like... He's walking around town. He's looking for places to dump a body. He settles on, like, the city dam. And he's recording it on, like, old-style tape recorder. Takes a picture with a fucking Polaroid. It's like... Do they not have digital cameras? Or are you just a trying to be so... Phone? No, just like a, a Polaroid picture. Just like... Yeah, like, no, that's what I'm saying. Is that, no, I'm saying is, like, you don't have a digital camera exactly. or a cell phone. Like... Are we that committed to, like, hipster, twee adorability that we're gonna fucking plot a murder with this? He's gonna write down... Is he gonna write down notes in a Spongebob Squarepants notebook or something? What the fuck? <laughs> I, I, like, I like one thing you, you said in your review, which was that, um... Coming to this website at some point. Yes, yeah. <laughs> it, um, uh, it, uh, 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 the, the, the Jane Lieberherr character, Henry, at the beginning of the film, he gives a... Uh, uh, a speech about, you know, how, you know, your legacy is the good deeds you leave behind. <laughs> and then, you know, you, you pointed out, Mo, that it's like, you know, well, you know, that's, I, I think what you're saying was that's kind of scary because this kid kind of seems like a school shooter. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. I'm like, I mean. Like his idea of what good deed is, you know, taking murder. out people. That, yeah, like, yeah. Just whoever yeah. I have deemed as bad. It, like, like, the guy is unambiguously a bad guy, and they, they actually do, they do take the steps of, like, he's gone through all the legal channels, and they haven't worked, so this is his next step. 
but it's still an 11 year old plotting an elaborate murder scheme. Well, you could also This would go... be so much better if it were a horror movie. Like, my, my, fav my favorite, like, terrible moment of the movie, this is my favorite terrible moment, is we get to the end, like, the climax takes place around a talent show. And so, we, like, they, they cross cut between, like, the talent show and the mom going to kill Dean Norris. And it's supposed to be, like, artistic and shit, but it's like, no, this doesn't work. This is tonal this dissonance. This doesn't work. Um, the, the, well, well I, I just have to make point on one, one part of that for please. a second. There's some, uh, uh, there's this part, you know, where, you know, it's, it's cutting between her, you know, you know, with the gun getting ready to make the kill. And, um, uh, a tap dancing performance, and like you see her running, you know, towards the place where she's gonna make the kill, and you hear the sound of the tap dancing because it's like her heart pounding. Get it? Get it, audience? He did a thing, like what they did in The Godfather, but not as good. <laughs> he did a thing, and his mother, child, vigilante, you know, Steven Spielberg, Wes Anderson, it's, homage. It's a mess. It's a hot mess. But they, they, they're, they're at the talent show, and uh, one of the people performing, one of the kids performing is the neighbor girl who he's trying to save, who Henry had a crush on before he died. And she does, like, a ballet recital. And we, like, offstage is the principal, who Henry went to a bunch of times to be like, she's being abused, here's some stuff I've noticed that is, like, the telltale signs of abuse. And the principal went, no, her dad's the police commissioner, so I can't do anything about it, so I'm not gonna harass him. Um... But she's off stage watching the daughter dance ballet. The daughter looks like she's about to cry at any given moment. Like she's crazy sad. And then the teach the principal looks at this like, huh? Maybe there was something to what Henry said. It's like, oh my goodness. That's the that's the moment you thought to call child services. Uh, is when the like the stepdaughter looks kind of sad. Yeah, she you did kind of sad. Abuse. You didn't bother asking the stepdaughter about anything. You didn't bother going to the dad. You didn't bother listening to this like child genius who was right about everything apparently. <laughs> but she looks kind of sad. So abuse is happening. Must be. That's the only logical step I can make. You know, when I watched that scene, I, I thought one thing and only one thing. This guy should really direct a Star Wars movie. He, he, this guy should really direct the Star Wars movie that was going to be for Carrie Fisher. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. This, the, the, they're, they're not going to fire him. They're not going to fire him because of Jurassic World uh, making, making so much money. But they, if, if, they, if they cared about quality and not just making a buck... They would have fired him the and second. There's more, interest, there's more interesting directors out there. Yeah, yeah. For heaven's sake, just let Ryan Johnson direct two of these. I, yeah, you know, I'd be I down mean, for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, all right. Oh, all right. I, Patty Jenkins just made a, bu a boatload of money with Wonder Woman. Get her on board. Yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah. She has to go make Wonder Woman two now. Yeah, good, yeah. <laughs> good. <laughs> Well, I think I think that's everything I got. Anything that was, else? That was very productive. Up? Was it, no, I was gonna say I was like I have not seen. I was like I think we talked about all the movies I've seen. Everything we'll that I've, I've I've been actually catching up. I saw Logan, Lego Batman, John Wick two. Oh, Lego Batman was good. Lego yeah, Batman was, was good. Yeah. <laughs> Again, By the way, I'm kind of excited for Lego Ninjago because I saw the trailer and I was like, that actually looks funny. I like. I'm like, looking I at it with like, like nothing movie. about Ninjago. I don't either. Yeah, like, I, that I, is, I, that I, is, I, like, I came into that. I don't movie. even know if I would be into that if I was the right age range for it. <laughs> I don't but even really understand what it is. But I, there you I, go. It, I think it's just It's ninjas. just a different it's a different series of Legos. It looks like there's robots though too. Nin ninjas and robots. Ninjas okay. And robots. There you go. That sounds better than Cowboys and Aliens. <laughs> <laughs> Probably will be better than Cowboys and Aliens. <laughs> well before uh, we uh, we sign off, uh, I wanna do what I've been doing for the, the past few times. I've got a quote I wanna read to you guys. Go um, for uh, it. Uh, as you know our you know discussion proves, you know, I mean, there's there's a lot to be d jaded about in the summer months, you know, movie going, because, you know, there's, you know, for, uh, uh, for, for every, you know, movie that, uh, really, uh, hits the mark, like the underrated Cars 3, he says, editorializing, <laughs> um, but uh, there is a, there's that a movie, fine. like, uh, The Mummy, that, you know, just <laughs> is a stink bomb, albeit in a very entertaining manner, but, uh, this is also, you know, you know, blockbuster season is, you know, an exciting it time. It is upon us. It is, and it's, it's kind of a magical time. So I dug out this old uh, article. It's from 2010. It's uh, by Manola Dargis. 
and uh, she's uh, she's writing about the uh, good things about blockbusters. So, just because a movie blows stuff up doesn't mean it automatically stinks. A good blockbuster, like the recent Bond flick Casino Royale, takes you places you might otherwise never go, and shows you things you could never do. It brings you into new worlds, offers you new attractions. It takes hold of your body, making you quiver with anxiety, joy, laughter, relief. When great blockbusters sweep you up in a way, I'm thinking about watching The Matrix the first time with a few hundred other enraptured souls. They usher you into a realm of communal pleasure. In a culture of entertainment niches, they remind you of what going to the movies can still be like. They also remind you that without the human factor, a blockbuster is nothing but a big empty box. Blockbusters that endure strike a balance between the spectacular and the ineffably human, whether it's Peter O'Toole framed against the never-ending desert in Lawrence of Arabia, or Keanu Reeves coming down to Earth in the Matrix as he realizes that he knows Kung Fu. It's the epic story of America refracted through one family in the Godfather films. It's a mechanical shark and Robert Shaw remembering the USS Indianapolis in Jaws. It's Tom Cruise hanging by a thread in Mission Impossible, and Christian Bale surrounded amid a cloud of bats in Batman Begins. It's Leonardo DiCaprio's Wild Eyes in Titanic, and Kirsten Dunst's Sad Ones in Spider-Man. This is... maybe... This, those are probably some of my favorite two paragraphs in all of film criticism, and uh, it, it, it sums up why, you know, even though sometimes I want summer to be over quicker <laughs> than it is, uh, because of, you know, movies like the aforementioned Mummy, uh, I... this is still my favorite season to go to the movies, even more than Oscar season, I confess. And oh, yeah. it's why I'm looking... It's up. easier to hit a good time. It's, it is. And it's why I'm looking forward to, you know, uh, War for the Planet of the Apes, to Dun for Dunkirk, for uh, Valerian, for uh, what's to come in the the next few weeks. Because, you know, this is a, this is a, a magical time, he says nostalgically. <laughs> <laughs> Nostalgically looking forward. Nostalgically looking forward. Yeah, we we come up with some pretty damn good paradoxes <laughs> here, if I do say so myself. God bless us, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, uh, I think that wraps up for today. Thanks to all of you for uh, tuning in. Remember, if uh, you like this podcast, please th click thumbs up and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Don't forget to like us on Facebook. And uh, don't follow us on Twitter because I haven't updated that thing in like over a year. So whatever. Follow us singly on Twitter. <laughs> singly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Follow us individually. Yeah. There you uh, go. But, uh, probably shouldn't follow me. I don't do anything. Like follow <laughs> oh. do. It's been a while for me too. I, I uh, last time I tweeted was to congratulate Sofia Coppola on uh, winning Best Director at Con, and then I actually saw The Beguiled, and I was like, "What the fuck? She won for that? <laughs> <laughs> Is that good? Oh, it's so horrible." <laughs> It's ghastly, but that's another story. Um, uh, don't forget to check out all the great reviews and content we have at thomoviereviews.wordpress.com. Once again, I'm your host, Ben Campbell Ferguson. I'm here with Maxwell Myers. Hello. I'm here with Mo Shawnette. I'm wearing a hat. He's Hi. wearing a hat. He's got it on now. And from all of us here at THO Movie Reviews, happy movie watching. Bye. <laughs> I waited for you guys to say something. You didn't disappoint. You didn't oh, disappoint. Every time. <laughs>